Welcome to Live from Tato's Cave. My name is Mario Veen. This is episode 19, Love and of Philosophy, with Jean Proust. We tend to think of philosophy as being about the abstract, about rational thinking and theory. But in episode 16 with Mark Reinhardt, we already discussed how Plato uses a lot of images in the allegory of the cave. And in episode 14 with Ilanta Sa, we spoke about how Plato emphasizes that the prisoner doesn't just turn around their head, but their entire body. And Plato uses a lot of references to pain, struggle and longing to describe the philosophical journey in the allegory. Our guide today, Jean Proust, describes her passion for philosophy as an aesthetic experience involving all the senses. Jean has studied humanities, philosophy and visual arts in Bordeaux, Berlin and Paris. She has been teaching philosophy for the last 12 years in the United States and her PhD dissertation focused on the pathologies of the willpower, both in philosophical and psychological perspectives. But their interests are wide. Among many fields, she does research in ethics, philosophy of technologies, feminist theory and aesthetics. While teaching at different universities in New York, Sean is advocating for a widening of philosophical education beyond academia by participating in different events open to the general public. She taught at Rilkers Island, a jail, as a volunteer and regularly gives public talks in philosophy. And this led her to produce her own podcast. Can you feel it? It's really good. She also collaborates with artists on her photography, drawing and painting works. And she currently works on articles at the crossroads of philosophy and psychology and starting a new book project about contrasting feminist views on female sexual desire. We should just start then, right? Yeah, absolutely. Because that's the beauty, because we don't know each other. And some of the guests I spoke to before, uh, yeah, I know already some for a long time, but we, we've never spoken before. And yeah, this is just one of my favorite things to do in life, to speak with somebody else about philosophy and just see where it goes, right? You do seem very enthusiastic about that. So I'm, I'm pretty excited because this is my <laughs> passion too. So there you go. We're two passionate people about philosophy. <laughs> you know what we should do though, just for quality purposes. So we're here in California right now on top of a mountain. And sometimes the internet might get a bit spotty. So just to avoid that, to, the, to take the least risk possible, I would say let's turn off our cameras um, because that might actually just make it a bit easier. Okay. <laughs> Even if I wish I would see your face, but I'm sorry. It's just, you know, we want the sound is what is going to stay yeah, at too the bad. end. That, that's more important. And the people that listen to this, they cannot see us anyway. Exactly. That's actually a nice segue because uh, I've been getting questions about why I don't do a video on YouTube. Mm. I, I could easily do it, but I, my feeling is not to do it. And sometimes mm. you have first the feeling and then the reasons come later, right? Mm. Um, one thing is that I really have fond memories of radio as a child. And I think there's like, I mean, this podcast is about Plato's Cave. So it's about screens. And then it seems a bit contradictory for me to ask people to look at screens while listening to the podcast. Mm, fair enough. Yeah, I'm I'm very interested in how you see that because the way I found out about you was through your wonderful podcast, Can You Feel It?, that you <laughs> uh, did with your partner, Johnny Nicholson. Yes. Yeah, first of all, I, I don't know why I didn't find it before because I've been looking for a philosophy podcast, but uh, I really love it. I mean, the production value is so good and... Um, yeah, Thank there's you. some nice, nice spaces to to think. I'm I'm glad you say that. Did Johnny uh, produce the music? <laughs> so yeah, Johnny did all the music. He's all behind the the sound quality and the production. And I have to say that there is a lot of philosophy podcasts out there, but uh, but sometimes yeah, the audio quality is not. Uh, I mean, Johnny is a musician initially, so that's really the quality matters tremendously to him. And uh, and it's 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 we wanted it to be some 
aesthetical experience as well, that it was not only about just, you know, the message that's being conveyed, but how it is being conveyed, you know, the, the pace of my voice and also the music that we would put in between. It, it's, I'm glad you say that because a lot of people uh, did tell me that um, the music might be a bit too intense sometimes to actually leave the space for reflection. And sometimes I was also going a bit too fast, etc. So, you know, even if the goal here is to reach kind of an audience that's not specialized in philosophy, I think it was more an experimental project for me, where now if I would do it again, I think I would definitely slow down the pace, uh, bring more silences in, and uh, and also just, uh, you know, develop the, the guest uh, host relationship where I would just interview more people as well. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was just, I'm, I'm glad you found it. It's, it's, it's just a little experimental project for Johnny and I that we worked on on the side, but I took so much pleasure working on this and I hope to have the time to actually go back and open season two relatively soon here. Oh, that's a uh, very good news. We have like a scoop here, I think, right? You're going to do, uh, you're going to continue. <laughs> well, I, I sure, I sure hope so. Yeah, it's, uh, and we have the visuals also that are important, etc. And that uh, I wanted to just bounce back on what you said about uh, YouTube. It's an advice that was, I was, I would never have thought about opening a YouTube channel on Can You Feel It? But um, a friend of mine and colleague of mine at NYU who has a YouTube channel and who has podcasts say, well, some people really don't go on um, on podcast platforms, they go on YouTube. Yeah. And so if you just want to reach a certain amount of people, especially perhaps older generation, you want to have a presence on YouTube. And it doesn't have to be a video with you talking, it can just be, and that's what I did actually, I just put the visual. So it's not, you're not even watching a video. You're just, you know, it's, it's a, you have like a little image there throughout the same image throughout the, you know, whatever, 40 minutes, 45 minutes of the podcast episode. But it's just to be on that platform seems to be important in order to reach out to more people, even if, you know, Johnny and I really didn't work on the PR <laughs> as much as we could have. It was more a project for us, uh, but we didn't, you know, try to make it famous or anything like that. It was just a, a, a fun thing to to work on but yeah it's it's regarding reaching out to more people i would say you know as little as i know about social media it seems to be the way to go unfortunately <laughs> yeah 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 it's uh, I, i'm getting to my question but uh, uh i'm just surprised how much we have in common because i pretty much what you said is the same with me except my setup is a little bit well you do have some guests but uh i i talk to guests and for you, it's a lot of um, a monologue with um, uh, music. Um, but yeah, I did the same, put it on YouTube. I also had uh, uh, illustrator Julian Penning that makes sometimes uh, yeah. illustrations for the I for like the that. Yeah, that's all part of the whole package of the aesthetical product that you want to deliver. And actually, I was pleased to see that uh, the, the main image of your podcast is actually pretty good. So... <laughs> So, um, so my question is, uh, why did you decide to do a podcast form instead of, uh, well, on the one hand, you could do a video like YouTube video. On the other hand, I mean, you could, uh, the things that you say on your podcast, you could write them down, you could um, publish them, right? Mm -hmm. So why did you, what was your intention with choosing a podcast form for philosophy? I do really enjoy the audio format. Uh, for a long time, first of all, I was an avid listener to a numerous amount of, of, of podcasts. Um, not necessarily What's only your philosophy. Um, my favorite is actually a French podcast, so unfortunately that won't help. But uh, it's, uh, it's a documentary podcast called LSD, La Série Documentaire, which means a documentary series. Um, produced by France Culture, which is basically part of the national radio in France. So the quality is very, very good. And it's uh, the, the presence of the journalist is very, you know, barely noticeable. And it's really about exploring, you know, social problems that, you know, France is facing on, you know, it, it can really be about any topic, but they go in depth and it's uh, it's very well done between experts and just, you know, lay people who would have something to say about this and narratives that are nicely incorporated. And I just admire the way this, uh, the, the, the craft really of putting the audio together, etc. that I always found that quite, quite fascinating uh, on top of just, you know, the, the, the relevance of the content itself, right? So the form is also very important to me and recording the sounds in the background to give 
a feel of the atmosphere in which these people are situated, etc. So that's something that really resonates with me. And uh, again, probably also a lassitude for the screens. So just having something on audio, it's something that I do every day. I go for a jog, I'm listening to a podcast, I'm, uh, I'm constantly listening to podcasts when I'm doing calls or chores, sorry. So it's really, it's, it's uh, something I'm very familiar with. And, uh, and then I began to do public philosophy in general as a public speaker, so in bars in New York, etc. And, and people were telling me, you should, have, you should have a podcast. That would be really great because I, you know, I, I received a lot of... Uh, um, of recognition from that work as a public philosopher in, in New York through um, an organization called Think Olio that I highly recommend for, for the listeners to go check out. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a pleasure to just be able to talk to an audience that's broader than the, you know, just the mere academic, very elitist audience that, you know, the, the, the philosophy departments, etc. I just wanted to get out of that a little bit. And, uh, and the podcast format for that as well is also very useful. So that's, that's where, where I, was, I was going with this project. And I really hope in the future that I'm going to make it, uh, I would say, an essential part of my professional activity. You say in your podcast that you want to get philosophy out of the ivory tower, right? Indeed. <laughs> I think that's something we share as well. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a challenging task to be quite uh, frank, um, either because it's not being all the work that a philosopher can do in public philosophy is not being really acknowledged by the academia. So that's not something that's going to make your career advance in any way. Um, it, it it's changing slightly. It's changing uh, since a few years, but it's uh, it's still pretty complex to make that work being acknowledged by that old, you know, dinosaur that the academic philosophy is. Um, but and then, you know, when you already turn your track, I guess it's hard to dedicate time to that. You're supposed to be publishing in, again, peer reviewed magazines or journals. And so that, again, targets, you know, uh, an audience that is already specialized in philosophy. And so I think that's that's a bit sad because we forget what philosophy is about to, to, to start with, which is really about this discussion among people. And, uh, and it doesn't have to be something that's just reserved to a privileged crowd of, or crowd, should I say, privileged few uh, of people on top of that ivory tower, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's great that there, there's so much more high quality coming out now. Like uh, my, my favorite is Philosophize This uh, uh, from Stephen West. Yes, excellent. Yeah, yeah, I love that too. It's amazing how he's, uh, he is able to condense something in like 20 minutes. Oh, that, yeah. um, I know I recommend it to everyone because beginners like it, but I always listen to it too. And I always learn something new, even if it's about... Someone like Heidegger, who I know really well, uh, I want to know what does Stephen have to say about that. And there's another development where uh, Rani Lil Anjum, I hope I pronounce her name right, and, and she will come on the podcast later this year. Uh, she teaches philosophy uh, 101 and philosophy of science, but she gives her students a podcast syllabus. Mm. It consists, they don't have to do any reading. They just, oh, they can lovely. choose every day, listen to a podcast, and that's what they use as a basis of discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would not encourage entirely that because I do think the relationship with the text, when you can really, no. you know, read at your own pace. I mean, mind you, on a podcast, you can press pause and come back, but it's not, I, but I love indeed also in my syllabus, I do have both. Uh, you know, podcasts and readings. And I think having both is really, really important. Just for, you know, a change of, a change of medium is, is something that just helps, you know, keeping students on their toe and being interested in the, in the subjects. I think it's, and, and the more informal way of sometimes the guest and the host expressing themselves can be more endearing. So I, I would also recommend, and I don't know if you know them, but the Partially Examined Life, of course, that goes yeah. in depth like and it's, uh, yeah. it's great, but not, I would say not really targeting a large audience. Quite frankly, some episodes there, if I didn't have any knowledge of, you know, Charles Mills, for instance, on race or whatever, I would probably have difficulties understand some of the vocabulary that is being used by uh, the hosts there. Uh, and, but a podcast that I think is very well done, uh, reminding me of Philosophize This, is In Our Time. Um, so from the UK, that is a great podcast as well that I highly recommend. Yeah, that's my second favorite. Oh, um, there you podcast. go. <laughs> 
So can, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you started philosophizing in your life? How did you get into philosophy? Alors, where could I start? It's interesting because for me, philosophy was precisely, I would say, almost a, a default choice of sorts. Uh, I um, was interested in a lot of things when I was in, in high school and I just constantly changed. It's not exactly major, you know, the educational system is different in France, but um, I just didn't know if I wanted to go towards humanities or towards science or towards economy and sociology. And I just constantly changed my mind. And I thought, well, you know what? Maybe I actually should choose a discipline that can talk about pretty much everything. <laughs> and that is philosophy. So it's really out of the inability to choose among the various disciplines that I ended up choosing what we call the queen of disciplines, namely philosophy. Um, and I would say that also it came from uh, perhaps, how can I say that? It came also from uh, a fascination for the aesthetic aspect, I would say. Uh, for uh, aesthetic aspect of philosophy. So here, for instance, I, I remember that uh, you mentioned Diotima's ladder of love, right? And Socrates attributing his initiation to, to philosophy to Diotima. And um, so it's, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's a beautiful metaphor, right? With this attraction first to a beautiful body and then, you know, to actual contemplation of the form of beauty itself, the form of the beautiful, right? you know, passing through all the steps of, you know, beautiful souls, beautiful laws and institutions, etc. But for me, philosophizing is, yes, about a form of elevation like this, a process of detachment, perhaps, of gaining perspective. Uh, but I don't believe, of course, in the theory of the forms uh, from Plato, but I find the description of Diotima aesthetically valuable. And indeed, philosophy for me is mainly aesthetics, not aesthetics that transcends or sublimates, you know, kind of the, the tangible experience, goes above the tangible experience, but aesthetics that renew our attention to this tangible experience, to what we perceive with our senses, right? After all, if you look at the word aestheticos from the Greek, it's, it means sense, perception, something that has to do with actual tangible perception, what you see and hear, but also what you smell, touch and taste. So philosophy for me is more an attitude towards these ordinary feelings, this ordinary experience that basically makes us able to contemplate, to see beauty in the most little things. A form of, I would say, an attitude of, uh, of hyper-consciousness that triggers a constant curiosity or interest. And that might link me back to my background in arts as well, because before I graduated in philosophy, actually, I was in visual arts, and so I was a specialist of, um, of um, oil painting, the old tradition of oil painting and art history and art theory. And, and I definitely relate the two disciplines, for sure. So, so, yes, philosophy brings a sense of perspective for me, of detachment, perhaps also, uh, I would say, a healthy indifference to ourselves, that, that I think is actually very uh, valuable thera therapeutically, in a way, where you always learn how to just not care and remember humbly how insignificant you are. I think it's, it's, it's a very good thing, actually, that philosophy brings to me. But at the same time, and paradoxically, it brings a great intellectual and sensorial curiosity, right? It brings this impossibility to get bored, basically. It's, it, it, yeah. you know, sitting in a room, for instance, waiting for, you know, a doctor's appointment. It's impossible for me to get bored as long as I have this sensorial communication and experience of the world around me, right? So philosophy is just, you know, it's not just an intellectual exercise for me, not just a theoretical research of sorts. It's also, it really has this existential dimension for me because it allows me to keep kind of this surprised, amazed look on little things around me to marvel basically at the world and the ability to see it anew. Very similar to how Bergson actually describes the role of the artist and the role of the philosopher as well, that discovers always new layers of reality and its various interpretations or appreciations, basically. Well, but that sounds very different from, I think, the image of philosophy, of um, you know, reason, reasonable thinking, analyzing stuff, um, 
thinking in the abstract, I think that the kind of um, image of philosophy is more of the aloof philosopher that is just like sitting in the study, but you connect it to actually your, yeah, your really, your whole experience of being in the world. Very much so. Smelling and all that stuff. Yeah. By the way, there was, maybe you know it, somebody wrote a book called Smellosophy, which is about the philosophy of smell. Oh, that's fascinating. Now let me take another. Smellosophy? Smellosophy, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm an, an enormous fan of, if there is one sense that really, you know, stands out, probably because I was very interested in perfumes. What a cliche of a French thing to say, but it's just, it, it's, uh, it's actually a very interesting thing to explore for me. And I remember one of my colleagues was working on disgust, the, the, the philosophical mm. accounts of disgust. And that I remember the talk she gave when I was in master classes a long time ago. And I was like, oh, and she spoke a lot about smell. I was like, that's an interesting thing. We're always speaking about, you know, hearing and, uh, you know, noble senses, like, you know, vision and, and uh, you know, and hearing, but we rarely talk about smell. And I think there is a lot, a lot to be said about smell in philosophy as well. Yes. And it's about taking these ordinarily experiences and making it, an object of, of inquiry. And I think that's where philosophy is in this attitude, precisely. Yeah, so philosophy is about everyday life. You're sitting in a, in a waiting room and you have to wait or your train is late or something like that. And instead of going on your phone, you're, yeah, what happens then? What do you, do you think about, uh, let's say uh, you're, wait, you're waiting for the dentist and uh, you're waiting there for half an hour. What do you start to think about philosophical texts or philosophers or what's going on in your mind at that time? I would I would be quite a machine to be <laughs> thinking about philosophical texts for the sake of thinking of you know of uh, philosophical texts. But it's uh, it's it's more generally an uh, a hyper attention instead of and it's an exercise. I'm not saying it's, it comes spontaneously to me. It's, uh, it's definitely, it requires effort for sure to not, you know, go on and exactly, you know, pull out your phone and start already, you know, kind of feeling the space, right? So it, it's precisely an exercise of trying to not feel the space. So it's really an exercise mm -hmm. of rethinking our relationship to time also, where, okay, here I have, I guess I missed that train, right? And so I have to wait for another train that arrives in 30 minutes. I can choose to be like, okay, so that gives me actually time to maybe answer that email and just, you know, make sure that uh, I, you know, I get that out of the way, etc. So it, it's sometimes I just force myself to be like, well, no, let me just observe what's around look at the face of this person here what an interesting face uh trying to perhaps imagine where these people are, are coming from the the body language that they might express for instance or the quality of the light at that specific moment so or you know what kind of mood i'm i'm, I'm feeling in but I, it's actually more i would say outward that it that it, than it is inward for me and here i'm not gonna develop too much on that but i think there is a lot of uh um, it might be a trap or a misleading path to always think of these moments as, oh, okay, I'm going to take advantage and now go into meditation mode and like get deep inside of me. I think not that I don't value that, you know, deep reflection and a meditative approach, uh, but I do think it, it, it really conveys the risks of narcissism in a way where you just look inside, you look, you know, you analyze what you feel about yourself within you. And it just, and to me, it's really more the opposite kind of direction where I'm just looking outside and I'm just looking at, you know, I'm, I'm listening to the sound, I'm watching the colors around me, feeling the wind, smelling the air, and just, you know, feeling that aesthetic experience. That's what I'm talking about here. So I don't know to what extent it's really philosophical. Maybe it is not. Some people might argue it's not. But I think being able to do that brings at least um, a contemplative approach to the world that is definitely prone to then let philosophical ideas emerge. Having that space having that attention to what's around us might be not philosophical per se, but perhaps the condition for philosophical thought. Yeah, and, and whether it's philosophy or not, um, what I get is that 
studying philosophy, reading the actual text, being busy with that is supportive of that kind of um, attitude in your daily life. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I, I would love to go back on, on that idea of, uh, of, um, of contemplation and of our relationship to time that actually changes. Um, I, I remember you being interested in performance, achievement and efficiency. I think that's something you actually discussed in previous episodes on your podcast. Um, mm -hmm. And it is, you know, to me precisely, the philosophical attitude has to do with fighting that obsession with performance, achievement, and efficiency, which is extremely hard to do in the capitalist society we live in, and definitely rubs off professions, even the most, you know, I would say, remote professions from that kind of, you know, uh, uh, search for success, uh, you know, being hyper-performant, etc. A philosopher should be detached from that, but indeed we are actually taking in that wheel, we're taken in that wheel just like any other person. But precisely, I would say where philosophy can help is to, to, to remind us that, that this is a dangerous attitude that we miss out here on probably a deep, you know, a deeper meaning or a, a more reflexive attitude that allows us to just see the world anew, etc. So it's, it's, you know, it's just, a, it's just interesting for me to notice when that's where I told you it requires an effort really to get into that contemplative mode. Even for me, sometimes when I have nothing to do, when I have nothing specifically urgent to do, I'm, you know, I don't know, I just caught up with the people I had to caught up with. I graded my midterm exam. All my applications are sent. I finished my article, I'm done. And sometimes I feel a malaise. I need to fill my schedule. I need to run and start, you know, work on something else, you know, or I'm like, maybe I should work even on myself, right? Which is always interesting for me to see how actually the you know therapy has become about managing or working on one's emotions right even the productivity logic uh, it rubs off you know this aspect of our life we say we work on ourselves etc so it's it's just you know I need to practice self-care you know I need to do something right and and this kind of productivity obsession this workism is is really really it's not it might not be a new phenomenon but it's really taking a whole you know different getting to a whole different level since you know basically the the the, the millennials you know generation which i'm i'm a part of there is really a specific burnt out i would say or perhaps after the 2008 crisis perhaps because of social media that creates this panopticon where you need to show everyone your accomplishments, right? And uh, not only in leisure, which needs to be awesome, but also in work. So it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting for me to see that it affects uh, maybe my generation more and the future generation probably even more, um, where we're, we basically all start to externalize, right, through social media and perhaps... It's, you know, even our experiences or the work we do is not even real until you slack about it, for instance. Or the vacation you're taking is not real until you Instagram about it, right? So it's, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I avoid social media, right? It's because I do think that it's, it's so powerful. It sucks you in immediately, right? And it's, it's I mean... And if you look at Slack, for instance, my partner actually uses it. I, I don't. I don't even know exactly how it works, but it's supposed to help you get rid of emails to be, you know, more social also, but also to, to, to I don't know, to, to, to just, you know, have something more, uh, uh, perhaps a bit less formal about work, etc. But what, what it does is that it gets even more overwhelming than email was, you know. It, but that's, just... uh, that's the irony, right? Because uh, I think word processes were supposed to save us time that we didn't have to go on a typewriter and email was supposed to uh, save us time that we don't have to write letters anymore. And now Slack... It's better than email, but every time uh, it turns out to be uh, quite different, right? Right, right. It kind of encourages this work signaling, like virtue signaling, you know, this compulsion to show people that you are working, you know, that. Uh, <laughs> so it, it, I don't know. It, it's, uh, it's like the new uh, surveillance of white collar work, you know what I'm saying? 
and uh, and to have leisure to, or to show that you're not working anymore by you know logging off slack i guess is embarrassing it, it, it not only does it you know d- d- does it make you feel probably shame towards your colleagues but also maybe you internalize that guilt and you feel useless right it's you you need to feel busy in order to feel okay with yourself you need to to feel busy to feel like you're in demand somehow you're useful so it's uh, it's um, it's interesting this treadmill phenomenon for me uh, and and to look at how we look at work in general today and and how that has reshaped our our, our relationship to time I just want to make some uh, connections with other episodes for for the listeners and then um, yeah ask you a question about this. So the first thing, I think you're going to like the next episode because I'm talking with Mika Ball, but I talked with her before. And she wrote this book called Image Thinking that just came out and it's about the relationship between philosophy and art. And one of the things, she's also a filmmaker and a curator. One of the things that she did in, in her exhibition, uh, because she says cinema is a time-based art. So you basically, you sit down and you're kind of forced to take the time. But mm. with painting, it's not like that. So uh, one of the things she does in her exhibitions is provide seating for, for people. Mm. So people sit down in front of a painting and it's yeah. a way... To kind of take time and I just had to think about it a while back when you said this taking so this is like an kind of an architectural way to to provide that but if it's not there you need to ma- do that for yourself to to kind of envelop yourself in the artistic experience mm-hmm. oh yeah I mean it's it's fascinating actually to go in museums and see I mean I, I haven't been in the museum in quite a while because of the pandemic but I do remember going to you know the MoMA the first time and seeing these people just taking snapshots <laughs> you know very, very quick pictures selfies in front of the of the of the picture they didn't even take a look at and so it's and to and all that for social media again huh? so it's it's it steals the actual experience to just prelive the you know the, yeah it's uh, it, it it is concerning for sure and has immense psychological effects yeah in your, I li- just listened today to your ep- podcast episode. I think it's the second to last one about positive psychology. Mm-hmm. And you did also one about leisure and work, which made me think of uh, the episode with Daniel Ross about Bernard Stiegler, where he explains how capitalism work. Mm-hmm. First, capitalism is about working, mm-hmm. but the next step is about leisure time. And leisure time is also... Now it's a time where you should have the best possible experience or you should share about it or you should work on yourself to become the best version of yourself. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it is, it, it's, it's actually very interesting to look at uh, even uh, I was, uh, I remember, I, I don't know who said that, but I think if you look at the word career, for instance, career is actually a very modern concept. It's a modern narrative about professional development where basically, you know, it's not anymore uh, that uh, you need to be better than, say, the generation before you, but on an individual level, you need to advance, you need to progress, you need to believe that you, your dream job is out there and work your way up, climb the ladder. There is really this idea of, uh, yeah, it's never enough, right? And it's really also very important to promote in the society we live in today, good enoughness. You know, just good enoughness, I think, is a very good concept to really sit down and think about. And also leisure, as you say. So not only we need an analysis of our economic system that is, you know, it's not us who should feel guilty when we actually manage to have a bit of leisure time. It's really the economic system that is responsible for that. Because sometimes people, I feel, are very afraid of blaming capitalism for their burnout, right? And they blame it on themselves because they're not efficient enough, right? So this logic of growth is really just, you know, it, it, it actually should logically lead to less work because it should reach a peak, as, you know, Russell yeah. says. It's like, that, well, now that was we don't the need idea, to... right? Right. Yeah, just work four hours uh, a week and the rest yeah. of the time spent... Uh philosophizing and of course we know that that school comes to word from the word for free time so learning which is that that actually connects 
to my own vision about because the question is what is the alternative right mm -hmm. for me personally um, instead of like thinking about producing an effectiveness and performance i would propose to speak about learning we're here to learn mm -hmm. life mm -hmm. is a school yeah uh, and we can learn in many many different ways you can learn from watching a painting but you can learn from like we are now both learning i think we're speaking to each other Absolutely. and we're trying to find mutual ground and uh, it's a dialogue right 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 and it's not and it's not only passive exactly so it's a form of leisure that is not just merely i would say relaxing which is also very you know very necessary but it's really an active form of leisure where you are just fulfilling a certain potential but not in a not in a productivity logic way nonetheless which is kind of hard to articulate because you know very often well, then fulfilling one's potential becoming the better version of ourselves it's also kind of the same logic but it's it's really not that it's just the ability to not be afraid of wasting time of our losing time you know but to to be able to take your time right it's 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 very very important to be able to learn again to do that that's also is something that we need to learn again that we have forgotten really how to mm -hmm. do it's impressive to look at people that cannot stay idle they just they, they go crazy they need an occupation right and there is this of course glorification of speed that you know parallelly by contrast you know goes with a social blame upon idleness that really is that's something that and, and that's maybe a reference that you might have um, may be familiar with uh, Byung Shul Han, a great writer uh, who did uh, work, um, did, uh, did uh, publish a book called The Burnout Society, which really speaks about that, this pressure of work performance. And, and I think it's, it's very important also in regards to the misunderstandings we can have as to the definition of happiness and happiness is trapped in that ideology of quantitatively measured success and achievement right so that's that's something that we need to let go of and it's it's it takes time because the ideology is very strong and uh, and we need to reevaluate a form of laziness leisure idleness that doesn't suffer from this from this social blame which which is a blame that you know exists historically for a very long time right so it's not i mean sloth was part of the seven deadly sins you know it's not it's not new laziness has you know very always in in christian society at least been perceived as as you know uh, the way to to even you know remember i think it's it's the devil makes work for idle hands so basically leading to evil even so it's it's really a, a, a huge a huge blame against uh, against against sloth and laziness etc but it's you know it's actually very interesting to to try to rework that concept and to see that it's well it's not exactly sloth because sloth also is more the depressed attitude of not being able to do anything out of burnout precisely but it's it's really a reevaluation of finding the time you're right to learn to contemplate again to reconnect with the reality around us without having this hyper connection to all these you know social media platforms yeah that to me what you just did that's that's a perfect example for me where you're because you're uh, many of the topics you speak about also in your podcast you know, love, friendship, happiness, desire. Uh, you're kind of in, I won't say in competition, but uh, when people think about those things, they also go to the self-help industry, which is they do. booming, right? Mm -hmm. But what you just did there was like, because I do, I mean, I am very spiritual, if I can say it in that way, and I meditate and I, I do many things like that. Mm -hmm. But what you just did about sloth, you kind of, Take a concept that people use and you do something with it. Mm. And I think that's what is many times is missing in um, yeah, other approaches. And for me, that's really specifically for philosophy as well. So you connect to something that we all know, like we all know laziness or boredom mm. or um, FOMO, which you wrote a beautiful mm -hmm. essay about. I, I will link it as well. Mm -hmm. 
to take something that people recognize, but then you do something with it. Mm. Is that how you see it as well? I think part of, you know, part of the learning process for a philosopher is not necessarily to bring more content into the picture, but more to analyze the content that's already there. And it's always richer than it sometimes appears. And so thinking about these questions, yeah, it's also a reflection on language. What are the words that we use? What connotations do they have? Where do they come from? Did their connotation change through time? For instance, if you look at, that's to me very interesting, even if I'm, I'm you know, I'm actually an, an atheist, but I'm very interested in the history of religion. And I think looking at the seven deadly sins, it's interesting to see that sloth actually um, is the only sin that doesn't have anything to do with excess. It's precisely the opposite. It's about omitting responsibility. It's about an annihilation of all desires, not about an excess of desire. It's, it's, it's a failure to do things that one should do, right? So it's about wasting the gift of life, basically, and neglecting the duties that come with the gift of life. So it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to, to look at sloth that actually part of the, uh, the original list of the seven deadly sins, sloth was not on there. It was acidia, which meant negligence or indifference, basically, the, the absence of care, not caring. So it's like this torpor, right? This, but that was often translated by sadness, despair, melancholy. So you have all that also behind the, the, the world. And that's why we potentially ended up actually, instead of just putting a moral blame on that, on this kind of inability to, to move this withdrawal from the world, we started to medicalize it and to call laziness basically a disease, uh, that a depression, uh, an apathy that needed to be medicalized, that needed to be, you know, taken, uh, taken on within, you know, the, the, the medical institution. So that's also is very interesting to me because it's almost as if we said the people who wanted to slow down, the people who didn't feel comfortable being at the pace of speed that society, capitalist society imposes, all now is being stigmatized as sick, right? And so that's that's something also problematic, you know. We maybe they're not sick at all. Maybe they're the healthiest of us all, <laughs> you know. That, yeah. So it's also interesting for me to just. So uh, it's very sometimes depression is a very healthy response if we look at, yes. for instance, climate crisis. I saw this documentary. It just came out. It uh, it's called um, Invisible Demons. Mm -hmm. It basically just shows the situation in India right now. Mm. When watching it, I felt like, um, ah, what's the movie? I can think of it now. Uh, yeah, A Clockwork Orange. Yes. Do you uh, a very remember that with part movie. where he, yeah, yeah, he sits in this uh, chair and, and he is forced to watch oh, yeah. images and his eyes are kept open. That's how I felt. Uh, I didn't want mm. to watch. Mm. But at the same time, I felt, but this is going on in, in our world. You're right. And, and, so, and that's what I reproach yeah. to positive psychology is to say, no, wait a minute, we, we don't have to be here. We ought to not be happy. We yeah. have to not be happy. Like it's not. And now it becomes a moral question. And if you keep telling people, be resigned, uh, adapt, uh, just, you know, be happy with what you got, etc. Don't indignate yourself at what you have no control over. It's actually a call for indifference. It's a call for indifference from stuff that should, you know, make us basically in angry, but perhaps sad, definitely. And that, that potentially paralyzes social movements that are very much needed in order to remedy these problems instead of always again looking at the problems from a very personal perspective, as if we were the source of the problem and therefore being happy is up to us and the perspective we decide to adopt on ourselves. I mean, that's just too easy. That's just, <laughs> and that's just false too. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's so. You know. So I, I want to ask you how do these two things relate to each other? Because on the one hand, you say uh, philosophy brings this hyper attention; it it enhances your aesthetic experience, and of course, from there, it's easy to make a connection with love, with with desire, with sexuality. Um, but on the other hand there are many problems in our society when it comes to uh, well the me too movement and um i, I already did an episode about racism uh but now specifically about 
yeah this this crisis of well men and women uh, men and men women women and everybody else who likes each other who wants to you know play with each other basically which is i think is a beautiful thing mm -hmm. but it seems to be so problematic in uh, in our society and i know that's something that you're working on and i'm very very curious about how you see that because it's not only you know the philosophy helping you to experience all aspects of something mm. taking time for it but this philosophy also can it also help us in let's say in the case of me too to address those kind of problems and the kind of frustration that mm. people are feeling for many different reasons mm. so i think the, the 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 most obvious link that i see between that kind of uh, uh, concern for uh, for basically the productivity logic we're trapped into and how it relates to desire it's it's i do think this obsession that we today have with individual performance independence and autonomy and individual responsibility where we become and i think that's a, that, that's actually a term coined by by byung chul han again who says we become entrepreneurs of the self right and and that actually he says makes us miss the authentic experience of love of the erotic the authentic erotic so the, this this sensitive sensible experience of being vulnerable in front of an other that we have that we can't control that we that we cannot make part of our you know very finely tuned daily controlled you know kind of kind of life like it's 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 not the other is always gonna surprise us it's always it, it's ungraspable and that very opening to the unknown is something that we have forgotten how to appreciate so today you know it, it's uh it's th there is an erosion of that otherness because there is you know parallelism is increasing narcissization of, of the self basically what we search when we look at the other is a mere validation of ourselves it's to increase our personal capital for instance you know in being on you know um, i don't know dating apps for instance and which i'm not you know actually entirely blaming i think adopting you know uh, uh, a dogmatic attitude towards uh, social media and new technologies etc and just putting everything in the same basket without any nuance is wrong as well i, I mean, i've seen that with you know a lot of gay friends for instance who's you know for, for them the dating apps was really something that helped them tremendously to regain confidence in their sexual orientation etc so i would not you know but but there is definitely this uh, this this idea of increasing our personal capital and of just trying to look at other people that we might desire as basically um, kind of a, a, a sum of boxes to check that we want to check kind of externally before we even meet the person. So this desire and love basically become subjected here again to a consumeristic logic in which really this otherness, this, uh, you know, uh, experience of the unknown is really annihilated, right? So that it's, it's this avoidance of vulnerability that you find a lot within a lot of people. I mean, really, modern consumers today want a positive, safe experience in a scripted interaction. And we, we find, I mean, a lot of my friends today looking for a partner are paralyzed by, by basically a fear of both rejection and commitment, which is kind of, you know, interesting. <laughs> and, and really, yeah. this capitalism we are in today with also this new, this new conception of love, which, which has changed tremendously over, you know, the last decade, has commodified our desire by removing all the threats that we might experience when we desire somebody we just don't know, right? And that we, we have no control over. No, you're you're saying that uh, one of the things that is lacking is is people's willingness or maybe their courage to open themselves to the unknown. Right. In love. Right. I I, I do think that uh, that uh, I've, I mean I I know a lot of people who are really desperate for this loving relationship who want to find a partner, but before they're actually considering how how love is way more something that you construct 
than the result of a mere checklist, you know, which, you know, I'm thinking about one specific friend here who's, who's definitely on, on, uh, on dating apps and who's always, you know, yeah. looking at all this, you know, it needs to match before she would even invest time because here again, nobody has time to waste. Right. So you want to make sure that the person you're going to have lunch with or go on a date with already matches all the prerequisites <laughs> that you want to see in your partner, which is really stupid. And it's, it's counterproductive. No, I don't want to use counterproductive, but it's really it goes the opposite way to me of what precisely love is. When you might meet someone who actually doesn't match at all what you want, to, what you thought you wanted in a partner and nonetheless by building some kind of complicity by playing together and by getting to know each other by changing also the person we are in contact with this otherness we actually build something that's way more beautiful than just you know the expected result from a checklist you know just <laughs> so of course this is a bit caricatural but yes it's it's something that i'm concerned with and that i think that you know obsession with not wasting one's time and this capitalistic, you know, culture is definitely destructive of, of desire and of love in that regard. Yep, I, I'm connecting to this in my own life when I see, I think at first I dated people that were a little bit like me or mm -hmm. that were like my, the image. Mm -hmm. my, I, I've been married for a couple of years now. I really love it. Nice. But that's, that's one of the things my wife, does she gets me out of my uh, thing so i you know i'm a philosophical intellectual person and everything and and she disrupts that you know right. i'm reading something it's like why are you looking so serious <laughs> and my first yeah. reaction is if if somebody else someone else would do that would be like uh, frustration and whatever but then there's this love which i don't think we should define love or something but it, this love gives like this oxygen or something mm -mm. where you can do, you know, basically you can do whatever you want mm -mm -mm -mm. and you'll be seen and you'll be accepted. Uh, you, even if you're playing a role, that that's fine. So yeah, when you speak about vulnerability and opening to the unknown is that when two people together, well, literally, you could say something can be created like a, a, a child. Right. But before that's maybe a physical manifestation of something else that can be created that you would, for instance, you would go on a holiday that neither of you would ever go on alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But because you get together, this is something else. Exactly. That, um, it gets you out of your comfort zone and what you think you like. It, it's really just an opening to, oh, wait a minute, so I always thought that I hated opera and now you want to go to an opera, let's see, well, and, and now I see a beauty that I actually had closed myself, I just closed that door, I didn't want to explore it. So we learn a lot about the plasticity of our tastes when we allow someone different from us to actually take so much space in our affection. And, and I think it's, 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 it, it, it disarms our emotional defenses. Perhaps it makes us, you know, more porous, more perm permeable to the other, right? And that's what's scary, perhaps, you know, that's why, you know, today this conception of love is, is, is so, uh, sounds so dangerous because we want zero risk, zero randomness, right? We are in this like safety ideology where we never want to lose control. And, and love indeed is a loss of autonomy to an extent because it's also a loss of certitude about you know your sense of self it's it's challenging your sense of self it's challenging your tastes it's challenging the way you think about yourself and it's uh, and i think it uh, in a very it can be in an unhealthy way but it can also be in a very healthy way and it's uh, and it's also interesting to see you know the uh, there is also a very interesting reference in regards to uh, dating apps that you can find in uh, eva Ilouz, who's a sociologist and she wrote this beautiful book called why love hurts and, and she speaks about the choice paralysis as well at play when you look at this kind of huge mass of potential interchangeable partners, right? This overwhelming number of possible matches and, and therefore leading to an impossible quest for the perfect match, right? So they, they, you're never going to find the perfect match that's supposed to combine all the qualities you're looking for. And, 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 it's, and it really takes away this idea of irrationality and gratuitousness and, and creativity of love right 
Love, it can, it can, and it's threatening too, it's, but it's not merely a response to pre-existing valued characteristics or expectations, right? So it's, it's really, and, and that I think is really a way t- totally, you know, uh, misleading perspective on, on, on love, leading to a lot of psychological despair today. Yeah. And uh, and yeah. it's, it's it's really it's really a concern. It's not merely just you know kind of a fun topic to to speak about. It's it's an enormous you know uh, source of of anxiety today in in our society, and and it comes partially I think from that very logic consumeristic logic and 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 refusal to look at time in a more plastic way with more flexibility where we allow ourselves to yeah maybe the first meeting you're gonna have with that person might not be great it's not you know but it might take time precisely just like when you meet a friend for the first time that very dear friend you have now in your life the first time you met them you didn't think they were very special it took you actually a year or two to notice how deep and special your relationship you know has become and so and so it's it's that precise you know Again, the conception of time and yeah. reflection on time that takes place here again. I love this conversation, by the way, speaking of love, mm-hmm. <laughs> because uh, the, the questions I'm thinking of, you're already uh, answering them. Oh, <laughs> um, yeah. No, I was thinking I, I love these situations where usually uh, you can see people. Uh, the, for instance, there are two people who are friends. Uh, they are mutual friends. And we know already they're they're going to end up together, but they don't know it themselves yet. Ah, or uh, yeah. this situation where one person loves the other person, but the other person just doesn't know it yet. So they need some convincing and, and whatever. And uh, right. some of the most beautiful relationships that I've heard about was like, was it first love at first sight? No. Mm. No, I, I mean... Uh, she loved, uh, or let's say he loved her instantly, but she hated him. It was disgusting and blah, blah, blah. But he just kept on, you know, <laughs> persisting and persisting. And now have this, they have this beautiful um, yeah. marriage. Well, it sounds very much like my own story. So <laughs> I find it funny. And I, I think my, my, personal, my, my personal experience also definitely informed that reflection. Because myself, I think I... I had, like everybody does, a, a preformed idea of what I thought I was kind of looking for, and uh, turns out the person I'm with now is is quite uh, quite different from what I had expected, and and also that's interesting to go back on what you were saying about uh, the Me Too movement or more reflection about feminism, um, what what woman or men you know can be looking for in a partner of same sex or not, uh, very often is also. I would say, um, conform to certain standards of what is culturally deemed to be attractive, right? So it's interesting also with a feminist approach to look at the social pressure for women, for instance, right now to conform to the hookup culture that is also brought by these dating apps a lot, I would say, or or very much encouraged by these uh, uh, dating apps. And, And it's, you know, while I very much promote the idea that women should totally, you know, disconnect if they want to you know sex from feelings and can have sex whenever they want with how many partners they want i I actually value that but we need to build a symmetry then between women and men in regards to their sexual activity i mean women today are still labeled with negative or insulting terms when they have a very active sexual life with multiple you know sex partners while most men are admired so exactly the opposite when they multiply their sexual partners. So this hookup culture, you know, sounds great from the outside as if we had, you know, more sexual freedom today. But in reality, it's also very normative um, and also very, you know, kind of convey contradictory injunctions for women who are both, you know, called, you know, they're kind of, you know, we invite them to be more sexually active and more open, etc. But unfortunately, the patriarchal structure of wait a minute no no you still need to you know kind of maybe not wait for marriage but for it's still very much ingrained this ideology that women should have sex when they have feelings etc so it's it, it's either or but it cannot be both and so what i'm saying is that let's work on getting rid of that old idea that women have less of a right 
to have that kind of hookup culture, but also let's give some space to the voice of women who don't want to be in a hookup culture and who just, you know, don't believe in that and don't want to just have random sex. That's totally fine as well. So it's really about opening, uh, opening some space for a, for a diversity of voices here within the feminist discourse, which only, you know, common denominator would be to say we respect what women want regardless of what that looks like. And even if it might actually contradict each other, it doesn't matter. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting for me to look at, uh, at, at that aspect as well, because young people's fear today, even rejection of sex, when we speak about people who are asexual, etc., might very well be the result of this kind of uh, sex positive movement as well, uh, which might become for some people the cause of some of the same suffering that it was actually meant to remedy. So it was meant to remedy that kind of patriarchal society in which, you know, women uh, were thought of as, you know, less entitled to, uh, entitled to less sex, etc., and to just, you know, more, you know, a prude attitude, etc. And I, I totally agree that we should fight that, that's for sure. But if you force people to be sex positive, to have sex, to be sexual, to be sexually active, here again, in a performance, you know, kind of ideology where you need to perform, you need to, you know, to achieve, you need to have more partners. Well, maybe not, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Who, who's to say that, you know? It's, uh, so here again, I, I, I think if we want to make sense of of feminist movements in regards to sexuality today, we need to embrace a wide array of voices from the asexual people to the very sexual people that, you know, that give space to everyone and hopefully fights on the same front that definitely women have the same right that men to be considered, you know, happy with their sexual life, regardless of the form that takes. Okay, I'm going to share with you two, two thoughts that might connect also to things that you are working on. Mm -hmm. So the first is time that keeps reoccurring and, and we will talk another time about Bergson. Mm -hmm. uh, people should listen to the first episode of Can You Feel It? Because that one is about Bergson. And to me, Bergson is like a, a good bottle of wine that I'm waiting to open. Mm. So, but let's open it another time. Okay. The thing I was thinking about in the context of love is, so I want to ask two questions, one on more a societal level, but first the one on a more personal level. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that is really a, a problem has to do actually with time. Mm -hmm. Because what happens when people have, um, uh, well, we both live in a society where people have multiple relationships, where dating is uh, normal. Um, you, you date a person, you break up, maybe it was not a good breakup. But then the next person is not the unique person that they are, but they are, you know, better than your ex or they're not your ex. Mm. And this like the past is creeping into relationships and i think if if i look in my own life if i look at life uh from people around me that's it's always the past is messing it up <laughs> right we can't help but compare yeah and is there something because i know time is of great interest to you in philosophy and is there something some advice that you have for <laughs> to basically prevent that from happening or is that just how it is like you go on a date mm -hmm. you want to be completely open to that person instead of comparing them or, or idealizing them but just like the real person that's sitting in front of them you want to get to know them how do you do that mm. I know I, I would have something that might sound like a pessimistic answer to your question I do think it's it's pretty um naive to think that the, that we can somehow put the past aside and and have just you know brand new eyes on that we can lay on on, on that person and uh, I think it's uh, it's um, you, you won't you you can't help but of course even subconsciously comparing I think the person that you're about to engage in a relationship with your previous relationship I think that that's very hard not to do uh, but depending on uh, perhaps the um, the powerful effect of that person on you 
and and how precisely they really make you extremely curious they just you know take you out of yourself so to say they just you know they they draw you to, to to themselves instead of having you just think of what you want what you need what you feel etc you're just entirely you know kind of absorbed by this new personality you're discovering and so that i think is when when really a new love is happening is precisely when you know you're drawn enough so you can actually forget even for you know a little moment these relationships of of the past and i think it's important to try to do it but i would still say that you know it and it might not be a bad thing you know down the road that you're comparing with your past experiences it's you know you're made out of your past your past is what actually shapes and sculpts the person you are today and it's 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 and you know and time keeps growing like a snowball as as Bergson describes it and you are bringing all this past with you but while you're growing and making these new experiences for instance meeting this new person you actually reshape kind of retrospectively this past uh, this narratives that you bring with you you look at them differently too so i would say there might be something interesting also into say you just got out of this relationship and all you feel now is anger and rage right and now you meet this new person and you're totally absorbed in their personality they make you just discover other aspects of yourself you're just discovering new tastes you didn't even know you're suspected could exist you're you know sharing all these new experiences etc you're you're really diving into it and now you look back at this old relationship and you don't feel anger anymore you don't feel resentment anymore and and you just you know perhaps even start to remember beautiful things about it and you feel okay without any regrets or you know uh, of a bitterness that you might have before so it's it's also interesting to see how the past itself gets reshaped by the new experiences you're now living in a relationship for instance but not only i think that's a great point that connects to also how i look at time also again a connection with mika bao she calls this preposterous like the the idea that the present can change the past mm -hmm. which is inconsistent with the idea that there's a timeline and of course we have all the marvel films about tra time travel and all that stuff right but right it all depends how we you know define what the past is when we speak about the past exactly. are we speaking yeah. about our interpretation of the past which is really memory what memory is and that's of course what i'm referring to here i'm not saying we can you know go back and <laughs> and change the course of events which is interesting i think in uh, it's in german you have these two words history and geschichte to speak precisely about the difference which we don't have i think in english nor in french we speak about history both as the discipline that interprets the facts of the past and as the actual facts of the past right and only german has this distinction it's like well no it's not the same thing <laughs> there is what actually happened and that's something you know we cannot change and that's just purely objective and then there is the you know the access we have which is you know through our own bias and our own memory of what happened in the past and so that's merely an interpretation of that past and so that's all i was referring to here is of course how we can reinterpret the past through the you know the the, the current experience we we are we are going through at the moment so that's an interesting aspect that bergson also develops on but i think it would be interesting to indeed perhaps have another episode in which perhaps we dedicate half to my work on on sexuality and half on Berks and something like yeah. that that would be that would be really really awesome that sounds great yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah i also had to think about michelle de montagne some oh. i think it's something like life is a succession of m misfortune and pain most of which never happened ah so the difference right. between yeah our memory our interpretation okay let's reserve that we'll we'll table that right, we'll put it in a little fridge for yeah <laughs> for another time but i do want to share that for me i think one of the main reasons for me personally to get into philosophy had to do with the past in relation to relationships like things that happened in my past that keep kept coming up in relationships but also the other person um you know you you have a relationship with another person but also with their past and 
that led me to a philo more philosophical question about what is the past and is the past fixed and and mm. we'll get into that more another time sure. um and so the more societal question i want to ask is um uh, another connection to an episode about uh, i'm going to speak with marcia bjornerud again a geologist mm -hmm. I love reading about other other subjects that I don't know anything yeah. about, other sciences, because I learned something, because I learned something from reading about geology that I didn't know, but which really clicked with something that I had felt mm. about this issue. And it has to do with uh, the connection is about uh, sexual predators in that, mm -hmm. same, in that sense. So predator is like, it's a biological term. It's like predation, mm -hmm. right? In philosophy, we can think about um, uh, Hobbes that says, well, we're at the, in a perpetual state of war. It's like uh, people quote, misquote uh, um, Darwin saying the survival of the fittest, the struggle between predators and prey. So I was uh, happy and surprised. That's not how I see it mm, at all. I, I assumed, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that for me, the default state is love. Um but I was very happy to read in Marsha's book that predation has a historical origin on Earth. Mm. And she describes how the Earth developed and biology developed. You know, there are many patterns that you can see, but at the same time, it's also very contingent, right? Just the fact that we have, you know, two eyes. Mm. Maybe in, if something else was slightly different, we would have three eyes or no right. eyes. And... I'm starting to suspect that something like that with predation is the same thing. That predation is something that we think is a, a universal principle, but actually it's not. It's something that we're continuously recreating. So you, you would say that it's contingent? It's like a, an, an accident of sorts? Yes. Hmm. Um, yeah, it is in a way it is contingent, but it is a response to a situation right. so and the situation is not contingent so it's adaptative mm -hmm. yeah yeah mm. so in the context of what we've talked about i was naming this example of let, let's say a boy and a girl or a boy and a, let's say a boy and a boy mm. right to bring some mm -hmm. <laughs> diversity and uh one boy loves the other boy but the other boy doesn't uh love that back but the you know, the thing that gets them over the, you know, convinces them is their persistence. But it also has elements of a little bit like, maybe like a little bit of aggression mm -hmm. or a little bit of pushing or something like that. But it's not experienced in a negative mm -hmm. way. It's a part of like playing, mm -hmm. like, like playing predator and prey, which can be a part of a play. But on the other hand, we had this situation in the Netherlands with The Voice of Holland. I think it's a program that is international as well. The Voice of, I don't know, singing, people singing. Mm. And there was this sexual predator that was the band leader. And yeah, he was uh, sending inappropriate texts, mm. uh, uh, touching women, everything like, well, the whole, a whole two, Me Too situation. Mm -hmm really like this predatorship that we're seeing everywhere in society now and it's i mean i think it's great that it's coming to the surface yeah. but then people are also saying if it's about a long time ago yeah but that was that was normal so it's still in a mm. sense it's considered normal that often men are predators and women are prey mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. yeah i don't know what question I, my, one question could be yeah, just how do you see that and where where is that line between like like erotic play, uh, the game mm. of seduction mm. and predatorship? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a very complex topic because uh, very often objectification is part of what actually informs the uh, the 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 erotic imagination of women themselves. So um, and and that's that's uh, you know part of a big uh, a big paradox. Uh, and here I recommend the reading of uh, a French uh, 
a French feminist who's not an academic at all, so it's very easy to read and it's definitely very uh, blunt and written in sometimes a very crude way. It's called King Kong Theory by Virginie Despentes. It's kind of like the Bible of feminism uh, since the 2000s, I would say, in, in France. So really a, a short book, more of a pamphlet really than a philosophical essay, in which she describes how her own desire is also shaped by rape fantasies where she would be the prey, she would be the object with predators who would be the men. And so, and, and, and she, she struggles with that. And that's one of the things that I think we don't speak at, you know, enough about and how also, of course, pornography or mainstream pornography, I would say, accessible by also very young children is already kind of conveying those messages that what is erotic, what is sexy is for a woman to be that prey, to be that object. And women, again, ingest that idea and, and actually em embody it and end up kind of even having their own sexual desire hijacked by it, right? And for a man to be basically... a uh, portrayed as a predator and you see that script obviously in, in pornographic uh, um, uh, videos a lot which is a concern because then it's very often what you know children aged sometimes eight or nine would be looking at as their first form of sex ed so we'd really need to speak about that and how how female sexuality has been indeed hijacked by this kind of ideology and, and, and power dynamics between prey and predator and how we can and should perhaps, uh, you know, somehow reshuffle the card and, and, and help kind of create another matrix of fantasies around, you know, other different kind of power dynamics that are you just you know more diverse and i'm not saying we should throw out of the window entirely the you know predator prey kind of you know canonical uh, unfortunately uh, uh, relationship between you know um, between men and women very often in a heterosexual setting because that if that's part of a play if that's part of a consensual kind of you know game erotic game that is put into place why not i would say but it needs to be i think very clearly stated especially to children whom we you know who we don't talk about sex enough i think it's very very important you know it's beautiful to be an academic feminist but we don't do much to actually go in school and have those sex ed classes implemented in the curriculum to make sure that these children understand that this is not the only script available and that, you know, they should feel comfortable exploring other scripts and that actually this script comes from a very specific culturally, you know, problematic background that we need also to challenge. And so it's, uh, you know, but here again, that would lead me towards my whole reflection on this, you know, kind of difficult conundrums that I think women have to face today and men as well. Uh, in their, you know, definition of femininity and masculinity and in the way they shape and perceive their own sexual desires. Well, I'll be very interested to talk with you about that in, uh, yes. in another episode. With pleasure. For now, I want to thank you so much for this conversation and ask you one final question. Yeah. Um, which is a question I get a lot as well. For people, many people are interested in philosophy but uh, besides uh, from listening to podcasts, uh, do you have any advice for people how, how to get started? Do you start to, I mean, one of my friends got like, uh, I don't know, got like the phenomenology of spirit or something mm -hmm. uh, from Hegel. That's maybe not wow. the best entry point. I would but, not go that way. <laughs> but on the other hand, sometimes if I see the popular philosophy books, I think, well, they're kind of, you know, childish in a way yeah. they don't really take you seriously you yeah. know so do you have what what is your advice to people who want to mm. know mm. more about philosophy so i mean i would say read bergson <laughs> just just i mean yeah. that's one advice i would give just because it was the way i fell in love with philosophy personally or i i consolidated my love for philosophy i would say uh, because of just the clarity and the elegance of the language. So here again, I think the, 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 the beauty of the experience of contact with the text is a very important and, and it needs to be a pleasant experience. And in very, very often, you know, philosophical text, especially, I mean, 
in the continental tradition or the analytical tradition, I would say I would, I would tend to be more an anti-analytical tradition because I think it's very cold. Uh, but uh, but, yeah, uh, but it's, it's just a personal thing, I guess. You know, people can take a great pleasure also at reading texts that are very logically, you know, fine-tuned. And um, I'm more of an intuitive thinker, I would say, than an analytical one. Uh, but I would also say, again, to go back at what I said at the beginning about the attitude, right? It, it, if you want to train yourself in philosophy, sure, you need to read text and perhaps start with philosophers who actually write clearly, such as Bergson or Bachelard, for instance, another example. Um, but you also really need to adopt this attitude of questioning all the assumptions that you can, including yours, right? And that kind of lead me to um, the interpretation of uh, Plato's allegory of the cave, if you'll allow me to get there to, to, to end. <laughs> I forgot right. to ask you about I, I, I was this, surprised. Like... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so it, it's actually a hard question because I've been academically trained to interpret it in you know one specific way. Yeah. And uh, I, I always enjoyed the way cognitive habits are actually described in the allegory. When the prisoner, as he gets out, suffers from the change of light, right? It hurts his eyes, etc., and it, you know, he just it, it, it cannot really look. It's it's really hurting. So, changing one's opinion, you know, if we, you know, of course, understand the metaphor here, is extremely hard. It hurts. It's almost like a metaphorical amputation of the opinions, you know, that were deeply ingrained in your belief system previously, right? So, it, it, I really think it's it's interesting to um, to look at, at at that violence, right? And also at the violence with which the liberated prisoner is likely to be treated by the prisoner who stays in the cave when he comes back, right? So it's quite extreme. The, you know, Plato says, well, they would likely kill him, you know, uh, so which, which is super extreme. They would laugh, but they would also kill him. I, was, I always found that surprising. It's quite extreme. But I wonder if this reaction imagined by Plato is provoked either you know, only by the discomfort of having a stranger in the herd, so to say, or simply by the self-righteousness of this new stranger, right? So when, when this prisoner comes back, mm. he says, oh, I, I bless myself for the change. I think those are the words used by Plato. He would bless himself with the change and pity the other prisoners. And that's very, that sounds very self-righteous, that now I know the truth. And I'm not putting it into question anymore. So to me, the allegory of the cave is precisely like a, like, like a wolf story of sorts to beginners in philosophy. To scare us off uh, the temptation to be self-righteous, pretentious with the wisdom that we can get a glimpse at. But again, we're lovers of wisdom. We're not wise ever, right? And so it's a good lesson to, for us to kind of remain humble, remain aware that we should you know, stay away from complacency. And a lot of philosophers, as I know them, especially because we are also supposed to teach and to mentor, we end up forgetting to be humble about our own beliefs. And we might end up, you know, taking ourselves a bit too seriously. And so perhaps, you know, one thing that I would recommend people who start in philosophy to not take themselves seriously, to always challenge their own assumptions, you know, to, to, to avoid to be, you know, the killed stranger in the allegory of the cave. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for reminding me to ask the central <laughs> question of this podcast. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad. It's, it's, uh, it's been interesting for me to think about this allegory a little bit again. And, and I really look forward to our second discussion on uh, sexuality and perhaps Bergson, if you find time for that as well. Yeah, exactly. But uh, what text should people start with, Bergson? Um, so uh, maybe... Because I have Matter and Memory. That's oh, a big that's, book. That's, I would not start there. Perhaps what I would start with is actually um, a, a collection of conferences that Bergson gave that were not uh, specifically, uh, you know, targeting the philosophical audience. So that's kind of, you know, also, also helpful. And it's called La Pensée et le Mouvant. It's relatively short books made out of, I don't know, remember exactly how many conferences that are, you know, uh, uh, basically just put into texts. And it's, uh, and it's just beautiful reflections about philosophy in general and already, of course, uh, uh, hinting towards, uh, very much towards the conception of time that Bergson, you know, uh, puts at the center of his reflections. 
So la pensée et le mouvement, which I guess would be translated by um, thinking and movement or thinking and moving. I'm not quite sure, uh, but... I, I'll, I'll put it yes. in the show yeah, notes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That, that would be where I start because... The, one the, advantage of podcasts. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And one really positive aspect of this book is that, again, it's it's you can take one conference at a time and they're short and they just, you know, mm. open your eyes to certain things you might not have thought about before. Yeah. Great. Some homework for our listeners. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Mario, for having me. And thank you for listening. See the podcast description for more information about Sean. I also listed most of the sources we discussed in our conversation. So we will do another episode together after the summer. And your homework for that episode is to read Bergson's Le Pensée et le Mouvant, which is unfortunately translated as The Creative Mind. Go to livefromplatoscave.com for ways to support this podcast. This is an independent educational project and I don't have any funding. So I really appreciate any support you can give through Patreon or otherwise. <laughs>